Hey Extension 2, welcome back to McGrathematics. For today's lesson, we are starting off our new topic of mathematical proof. First lesson is called language and symbols. So we're looking at a bunch of new terms and mathematical symbols that you would have never heard of or used before. And they're all really important for um, mathematically proving statements, which is what we're doing in this topic. Okay, starting off with uh, what's called an implication. So this, um, this sort of double lined arrow uh, mathematically, this symbol represents an implication. Okay, so X and Y are going to be two separate statements. And this is read as that if X occurs, it implies that Y is also occurring. Okay, so the way we read this is X implies Y, or if X occurs, then Y occurs. A couple of examples. Uh, so if N represents an even number, this implies that 2N is even as well. Okay, this is true if you take any number, which is even, and you multiply it by 2, um, that is still even, okay? So 4 times 2 is 8. 4 and 8 are both even, okay? So this statement implies this statement. Okay, if we reverse the direction of the implication, so instead of x implies y, if we write y implies x, we refer to this as the converse statement, okay? So the converse of x implies y is y implies x, okay? Now, if we know that X implies Y is true, that doesn't necessarily mean that Y implies X is true. Sometimes it will be, sometimes it won't be. Okay, so for an example, we have um, statement X is that a, stu a student is studying extension to mathematics and statement Y is that a student likes maths. Okay, now X implies Y is true. Okay, if a student is studying extension two, this implies that they like maths. Don't know why anyone would study extension two if they don't like maths. So that's got to be true. However, if we reverse the direction and look at the converse statement, y implies x would be read as a student likes maths implies that they are studying extension two. Okay, that is not necessarily true. There are plenty of students out there who enjoy maths who are not studying extension two. Okay, so the logic works one way, but not necessarily in the other direction. Okay, up next we have what's called equivalence. So this is when your implication is gonna be true, uh, whichever way you apply the logic. So for an example, we have statement A is that a quadrilateral has two parallel sides. Statement B is a quadrilateral is a trapezium. Okay, now since A implies B is true, so if a quadrilateral has two parallel sides, it must be a trapezium, that is true. If we look at the converse statement, B implies A, a quadrilateral is a trapezium implies it has two parallel sides. That is also true. Okay, so our logic in both directions is correct. A implies B and B implies A are both true. So we have what's called a logical equivalence. Okay, the way we can write this is A and B with a double headed arrow. Okay, we read this as A implies B and also B implies A. Another way of thinking about this is that A is true if and only if B is true. Okay, so this symbol for um, a equivalence, which is an implication in both directions, we're also gonna think of this as if and only if. And in mathematics, the shorthand for if and only if is IFF. Okay, so if you ever see IFF in any mathematical text, um, that's shorthand for if and only if. Okay, sweet, up next we have what's called the negation, which is kind of like the cancellation of some logic. It's kind of like how I think about it. So for, for the notation, if we have X representing a statement, if we have this, um, this crooked shape, this like weird looking F in front of it, this would uh, be denoting the negation of X, which is gonna be thought of as not X, okay? Um, alternatively, some texts use this tilde symbol as negation. Um, I'm not quite sure yet what the HSC is gonna use because they haven't used it yet, but I'm expecting them to use one of these two symbols as their negation symbol. Syllabus isn't crystal clear on that. Okay, now what happens is if X is a true statement, that implies that the negation of X is going to be a false statement. Okay, so, so true statements, if you negate them, you get a false um, answer essentially. All right, examples make this stuff make way more sense. So for an example, if X is the statement, every math student enjoys calculus. If we wanted to negate that, okay, so we wanna cancel out every math student enjoying calculus, all we would need to find is one student who does not enjoy calculus. Okay, so if our statement is every math student enjoys calculus, the negation would be that not every math student enjoys calculus. Or another way we could say that is that there is at least one math student who does not enjoy calculus. That would be the cancellation of our statement X or the negation as we call it. 
Okay, a couple more examples. So here's another statement. So X is, if I study, I will do well in the first assessment task. All right, so here we have an implication. The first half is, if I study. The second half is, I will do well in the first assessment task. Now, thing to be aware of, if you are negating a statement like this, the first half of the statement is gonna remain unchanged. The second half of the statement is gonna be reversed, okay? So if we wanted to negate X, we would still be studying, but then we are not gonna do well in the first assessment task, okay? So if I study, I do well on the task. The negation of that is I study, but I don't do well, okay? So once again, the first half remains the same. The second half, we negate. Okay, and for a third example, um, if McGrath was uninteresting and illiterate, and we wanted to negate that statement and prove why that is um, not true, which would obviously be very easy, all we would need to do is show that McGrath is either interesting or he is literate, okay? So when we're trying to negate an and, that's kind of gonna turn it into an or, okay? So the, so the negation of this and this happening is this or this not happening. Okay, so for our negation, so our statement is McGrath is uninteresting and illiterate. Our negation will be that I am either interesting or I am literate. Okay, so the kind of rule that I teach my students to make these questions a bit simpler is that if you negate an and, you're going to turn it into an or, and if you negate an or, you're going to turn it into an and. All right, we'll do a few more examples on this later on, and that might start to make more sense, but it is a bit to wrap your head around at the start, I find. Okay, for our next uh, for our next buzzword, our next bit of terminology is what's called the contrapositive statement. Okay, so if we have a statement x implies y, the contrapositive of that statement is negation y implies negation x. Okay, so we negate both x and y, and then we re we reverse the direction of the implication. Okay, the reason we care about this so much is that because if a statement is true, then its contrapositive will also be true. Okay, likewise, if a statement is false, then its contrapositive will also be false. Why this is a really powerful fact is because sometimes a contrapositive will be much easier to prove than the original statement, okay? We'll be doing a lesson on this in a few weeks called proof by contrapositive. Okay, but for now, all you need to know is that the contrapositive of X implies Y is not Y implies not X. Let's look at a quick example. So if we have, the first part is, if a number ends with, with a five, this implies that then the number is odd. Okay, so the contrapositive, we're going to negate these two halves and we're going to flip the direction. So the negation of a number being odd would be a number being even. The negation of a number ending in five would be a number not ending in five. Okay, so, so in, and then we reverse the direction so the even part is at the front. Okay, so here is our contrapositive statement for the statement uh, above. Okay, another quick example to make sure you know what we're talking about. So we have, if you subscribe to McGrathematics, you will get a 99.95 ATAR. Okay, if we wanted to take the contrapositive of that, we'll start with the second half and we'll say you won't get a 99.95 ATAR if you don't subscribe to McGrathematics. So once again, we're negating both halves of the statement and we are reversing in the order. So if you don't get a 99.95 ATAR, you mustn't have subscribed. And as I'm sure you're aware, both of these two statements are completely true. Okay, up next we're looking at um, some notation we use to talk about special sets of numbers to try and cut down on our word count when proving statements. We mentioned these in a uh, earlier video, but we're going to have a bit of a deeper look today. So our first natural, uh, sorry, our first number set is called the natural numbers. These are the numbers that you can count uh, with in nature. So they go from zero, starting off there, and we have all the positive whole numbers. Okay, starting off with our natural numbers. If we take our natural numbers and we instead go towards the left of zero and start to include negative numbers, we now have a set that we call the integers. Okay, so our symbol for natural numbers is this capital N with a bit of a hollow space in the middle. And our symbol for integers is a capital Z. Last time I checked, the reason we use Z is because of the German term um, for whole numbers is called ganze Zahlen, so it's to do with Zs. All right, so natural numbers plus the negative numbers is called your integers. If we then start um, looking at between our whole numbers, so between zero and one, and start to get numbers like a half or a third or any fraction involved, we create a set of numbers called the rational numbers. Okay, so the rational numbers includes the integers, 
but then adds on the uh, numbers between whole numbers that can be written as fractions, okay? So a number is defined to be rational if you can write it as a fraction using whole numbers. So 0 0.2 is rational because it's going to be 2 out of 10 or 1 out of 5. 3 out of 7 is a rational fraction. And 0.5 repeater we could write as 5 out of 9, so it's a rational number. We use capital Q for rational numbers, Q for quotient, which is another term for a division, aka a fraction. Okay, now if you have a number that is real, but it cannot be written as a fraction, um, it's called an irrational number. If we add the irrational numbers into the rational numbers, we create a set of numbers called the real numbers. Okay, so the real numbers include the rationals, the integers, and the naturals, and they add on the irrational numbers with no exact value, or no fractional value, I should say, such as root two, pi, e, and plenty of others. Okay, now in extension two, we take one step further and we start to look at numbers which aren't real, um, which involve imaginary numbers, and we create a set of numbers called the complex numbers with a capital C with a little hollow bit. Okay, so think of this like a five-tiered um, cake. So the complex numbers do include all the real um, rational integers and natural numbers as well. Okay, so yeah, it's like a Russian nesting doll of numbers. Okay, some quantifiers now. These are some new symbols that you would not have encountered before in mathematics that allow us to, once again, just abbreviate and simplify um, lots of words into uh, a few symbols. So the symbols we're using today, the first one is this upside down capital A, and this represents for all. Okay, so for all numbers in a set, for example. We'll do some examples later, and these will make more sense. Our next one is this um, weird looking um, three or a backwards E, and this represents there exists. Okay, so when we see this letter or this, this character, we've got to think there exists, AKA there is at least one. Okay, this fancy looking um, E shape, this sort of curved E, this represents elements of a set. Okay, so it could be, um, for example, negative two is an element of the integers, which we can write using our symbols. After that, we have a colon, which um, in, in mathematics is a shorthand for such that, okay? Putting these all, all together as an example statement, here we have a lot of nonsense that we are now going to translate into English. Okay, let's look at the first half. We have for all Q element of, uh, remember the capital Q stands for rational numbers. So this first part is saying for all Qs that are a part of the rational number set. So this front part is really just saying for all rational numbers, okay? So for all rational numbers, there exists A and B, which are elements of the integers, okay? So for all rational numbers, there exists two integers, A and B, colon is such that Q is equal to A over B. All right, so what this statement is really saying is that for any rational number, there should be two integers, A and B, such that your rational number can be written as a fraction of A over B. All right, that's what we were saying before when we talked about the definition of a rational number. Any rational number can be written as a fraction using whole numbers. And that's what this is saying right here. For any rational number, there exists integers A and B such that Q is equal to A over B. All right, let's work through some examples and try and get more comfortable with all these terms and these symbols and concepts. So here's our first one. Our statement is, um, I am in Nara, therefore I am happy. Okay, so the first half of the statement implies the second half of the statement. First thing we're gonna write is the converse statement. Okay, now if you remember, the converse statement is the same statement with the logic reversed. So a converse statement will be, I am happy, therefore I am in Nara. Okay, so same statement, arrows reversed. Okay, the negation of I am in Nara, therefore I am happy. Remember from before when we have a two-part statement and we are looking at the negation, the first half of the statement will remain the same. The second half is going to be cancelled out. So the negation of this statement is that I am in Nara and I am not happy. Okay, it's the negation of our original statement. And for C, our contrapositive is once again, we negate both halves of the statement and then we reverse the order of the implication. So the negation of I am happy is I am not happy. The negation of I am in Nara is I am not in Nara. So we have I am not happy, therefore I am not in Nara. 
As we mentioned before, if our original statement is true, so if I am in Nara implies I am happy, if we, for argument's sake, say that that's true, then I am not happy implies I am not in Nara is also true as well. If our original statement, if you think that's false, it means that our contrapositive is also false. Okay, for example two, we are going to uh, look, some, look at some more negation because these are pretty confusing for first timers in my opinion. Um, it took me a while to get more comfortable with these. So here's four statements and we are going to write the negation of all of them. Okay, first statement is that A is less than B. All right, the negation of this statement would be to say that A is not less than B. The way in mathematics we write not less than is we say greater than or equal to. So A greater than or equal to B is the negation of A less than B. All right, for the second one, we have Travis wears blue socks or white shoes. All right, so he's doing this or he's doing this. Reminder that I said the negation of an or is going to turn it into an and. So we're going to cancel out wearing the blue socks. We're going to cancel wearing the white socks and we're going to have both of them. All right, so our negation is that Travis does not wear blue socks and does not wear white shoes. Okay, so he's not doing both of these things. Okay, for C, if Emma bribes her teacher, she will receive an A. Okay, so like from before, if we are negating a two-part statement, the first part of the statement is gonna remain the same and we're gonna cancel the second half. So we're still gonna have Emma bribing her teacher, however, now she is not receiving an A. Okay, so this is the negation of her bribing me and then getting an A. All right, for D, we have our fancy new symbols. We have um, for all N element of capital Z. All right, the way we read this is for all integers. Okay, N element of Z means it's an integer. All right, so it says for all integers, 2N plus one is odd. All right, so once again, the first half of the statement is going to remain the same. The bit that gets canceled is really the second half. So a negation for this statement would be uh, for all integers, so for all n, element of capital Z, 2n plus 1 is even. Okay, which is um, which is not true, actually. Okay, example 3. We're going to get some more practice using our new quantify symbols. Um, we're going to rewrite this, um, this sentence using those new symbols as best we can. Okay, so we have for any integer a, there exists a natural number b such that a squared is equal to b. All right, what this is saying is that if you take an integer and you square it, you're gonna end up with a natural number, which is true because even if you take a negative number and you square it, the answer will be positive, so it will be a natural number. All right, so here we go. First part is for any integer a. So the way we write that is for all a element of integers. Okay, this is for any integer a. Next part says there exists a natural number B. So to write there exists, we have to do that um, backwards looking capital E thingy. So there exists B element of the natural numbers. This says there exists a natural number B. Uh, for such that we do the colon. So such that A squared is equal to B. There we go. So why would you waste time writing all these words when you can just write these few symbols and it means the exact same thing and it's perfectly clear and normal. That's why we do it. That's maths for you. Okay, up next, we're going to try that in reverse. So here are some statements using all those fancy new symbols. We're going to try and rewrite them using as much English as we can um, to try and make sense of them. Okay, for example, A, we have N is not equal to K squared um, and K is an element of the integers. Then the square root of N is not an element of, okay, so the line through means not, basically. Uh, root N is not an element of the rationals. Okay, what this is really saying is that if n is not a square number, okay, so if n is not equal to the square of a whole number, then the square root of n is not a rational number. This is actually true. So if you take the square root of a number that's not a square number, the answer, well, the result will be irrational. For example, like the square root of 16 is rational, the answer is four, which we can write as four over one. Whereas if you took the square root of 17, uh, you would get an irrational number. All right, so let's write this as, uh, if n is not equal to the square of an integer, okay, n is not equal to k squared, where k is an integer. There's the first half, so n is not equal to the square of an integer, uh, then the square root of n is not an element of the rationals, so square root of n is not rational. 
There we go, no symbols apart from an N, just a lot of English. Okay, for B, we have for all P and Q, which are elements of the rationals. So for all rational numbers, P and Q, uh, where P is less than Q, there exists R an element of the real numbers. So there exists a real number such that P is less than R is less than Q. All right, so what's this trying to say? It's trying to say that for any uh, rational numbers where one is bigger than the other, um, you should be able to find a real number that you can fit in between them. Okay, it's kind of saying that if you gave me any two fractions, I would be able to find a real number that is between them because there's gaps between our rational numbers filled in by the irrational numbers. All right, let's translate this into English. So we have for any rational numbers P and Q, where P is less than Q. So there's our first half. For any rational numbers P and Q, P is less than Q. Now we have, there exists a real number. So there exists R element of reals, uh, such that R is between P and Q. Or you can just write such that P is less than R is less than Q. Once again, no symbols, just English and nice and, nice and clear, but not very fun. Okay, to finish off, we are looking at an HSE question from last year, actually. Uh, it was a band five question because a lot of people um, were confused by this and picked the wrong answer. Let's see if you do the same thing. Our statement is, if n is even, then if n is a multiple of three, then n is a multiple of six. Which of the following is the negation of this statement? Okay, four statements. You pause the video, give them a read, and decide which one of them you think would be the negation of this statement. All right, hope you pick one because now I'm going to spoil it. So the first half of our statement is n is even and n is a multiple of three. Okay, that's the way I read it. The second half of the statement is then n is a multiple of six. Okay, so remember when we have a two-part statement like this, I know it kind of feels like a three-part statement, but these first two parts are really joined. When you have a two-part statement and you're looking at the negation, the first half of the statement is going to remain the same. It's just the result that becomes negated. Okay, so straight away I know that n still needs to be even, n still needs to be a multiple of three, however, n needs to not be a multiple of six. Okay, so the way I think about it is the setup doesn't change, but the result is reversed. Okay, so for option B, we have n is even, n is a multiple of three, so the setup is still the same. However, the result now is not a multiple of six. So B is our um, is our negation. Well done if you picked that, because like I said, a lot of people last year did not. Okay, I hope that helped you uh, in some small way. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Cheers. Bye.